Well, good afternoon. It seems like it's been, this is the seventh, 16th or 17th conference, 15 years, and we're still going. Now, I'm not a conference speaker, and I never will be, because that's not my calling. But I do like to say a few things, and then they, with the real man, with the real ministries, are going to come and tell us the real story, the rest of the story. Well, we know that in Matthew 15, 13, 14, but he answered and said, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Let them alone, they be blind, and if the blind lead the blind, both shall fall into the ditch. What's this one? That's just a, okay. The root of a hundred years after the apostles of the church, and I'm a church history buff, uh, independent fellowships governed by elders and deacons, which each fellowship independent and use the gifts to set up ministries. Salvation was by faith alone in Jesus Christ. It were known by their fruits, the leadership, gifts of the believers to minister to each fellowship. They were trained locally and used locally, but worked within a number of fellowships in the area. Now Christ is the head of the church, the body of Christ, it's a good fruit. The Catholic Church, the universal church, governed by the bishops over numerous churches and nothing could be done unless controlled by the bishops, maintained there was no salvation outside the Catholic Church, adopted baby baptism and started the practice of traditions the first hundred years. And to my knowledge, but I know the, in, the independent churches at that point actually separated. Man, the head of the church, slowly moving into the one world church under the Antichrist, rotten fruit. The seed planting process started here, slowly, so no one would ever know until they were really looked and compared to the Word of God, thus the Reformation, but not all. And that was a number of years, a few hundred years later. The Catholic Church persecuted the independent churches in a span of a few hundred years, martyred 50 million people. Think about that. Then the Protestants persecuted the independents. Not as much, but the Protestants were interviews in the Baptists and the Baptists and the Puritans, and it goes on and on. Uh, whose side are we on? A showdown is coming, so we must decide to continue joining in their traditions or follow the pure word of God. One route leads to Antioch, which is 2 Timothy 3.10. Yeah, 10 to 13, okay. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, and patience, persecutions, afflictions, which come unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution, but evil men and seducers shall act worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. And we know that the other leads to Rome, from one to five. I know also that in the last days perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power they have from such turn away. But we were told to get away from them. So after 350 years, something happened that would affect the word of God, the tale of the three cities, Antioch, Alexandria, Egypt, and Rome. Three distinct cities, three distinct brothers of sons of Noah. 
One of them would be one of the biggest effect on Bible versions. His name is Origen. A Gnostic believer did not believe in the deity of Christ, the necessity of shedding of blood for remission of our sins. Hell felt he believed we could all become gods and much more. So change the manuscripts to come into line with his belief. Thus, thus every one of the new Bible versions contains many of these changes. Rome leadership believed that their bishops, soon Pope, were successors to Peter and thus added to the word place additions as important as the Bible in their position. 335 AD, Pope Julius proclaimed Esther, Queen of Heaven, was now Mary, and Tammuz, the son of Eschar, was Jesus. And she would rule and reign with her son. December 25th, the day they celebrated Tammuz's birthday, was now the birth of Jesus Christ. God man Christ, the Christ Mass would continue that through the new though the new through the new Queen of Heaven giving us the Roman Catholic Church, or should we say pagan universal church under the false Christ. I call Roman Catholic pagan universal, because that's what exactly what it is. It's a pagan universal church to bring you into the Antichrist. There are two sets of manuscripts out there. The traditional line, over 5,800 manuscripts from Antioch, which brings us to the authorized version translation. Alexandria text line, 45 manuscripts, of which no, none agree, but give us multiple versions, a large portion owned by the Catholic groups. Believe it or not, the New King James, the, new, the, uni, the NIV, the American, New American Standard, Lucifer's Bible, Nelson Publishing, and Vonderham are owned by a Catholic group. Uh, one of them is Murdoch of the, of, the, of the Fox News has a numbered company that they're in and other ones. And so it tells you what they, they're making millions of dollars of so-called evangelicals with the Bible they've created to create mass confusion in the church. They tell me how they mixed a bunch up to hide their original source. Now I've been told that a lot of these manuscripts are lift up and David can tell you more about it, but they're kind of mixed a little bit. Now we know the claimed oldest were actually created in the 1800s. The rest I leave to our esteemed scholars who bring you the rest of the story. The good fruit is well rooted. God has a plan and cannot be deterred and it will happen as he planned. Isaiah I need some light, that's better. Give me light. I find this an interesting chapter because it's most one of the most, um, another one of the abused chapters, eight and nine. I am the Lord that is my name and my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare before you. They spring forth, I tell you of them. He's going to tell us before it happens. So he wrote the rest of the story in the Bible. If you want to know the new thing, it's the church. It's Jesus Christ, the Messiah. It's the tribulation. He's telling us all in the Bible. There's nothing new after that. That's the new thing he's talking about, because the book of Isaiah declares all of this as well. So people, he's got a new, new, he's did the new thing. He's giving us the rest of the story in the, in the book, the Bible, all of it. You read the New Testament, you got the rest of the story. Read the Old, you got the foundation. Isaiah 15, 11, so shall my word go forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the things around I sent it. What is God saying? There's many men say, "Why, well, his? If I preach the word, I'll not go void." But at other places, he said they don't hear because I shut their ears. What he's saying is, what I say in my book is going to happen exactly as I said it's going to happen, so you can count on it. And that's about it. John 8:32. So how do you know? Then he said, Jesus, to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and they shall make you free. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself to prove unto God a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. A true, the fruit of a true Christian, he studies the Bible thoroughly in the context it was written. I've had a number of conversations with people really recently who are having trouble with the Bible. So one of the questions I asked one gentleman, I said, have you read the Bible? 
Well, I kind of read here and I kind of read there. I just want you to read the whole Bible. You know, just why don't you read the whole Bible? I said, when I could save the Lord, put it on my heart, I had to read the whole thing. So I, from Matthew to Revelation, six times the first six months I was saved. You know, I knew the Word of God. My wife was J.W. at the time, or a wannabe, and she would spout all this stuff to her, and I could go to any place in the Bible and contradict whatever she said just based on the Word of God, because I read the Bible six times. See, somebody said, well, I can get, I said, but you've, you don't get it all in one book. You've got to get the whole book into your heart. You've got to get it into you. And to get it into you, you've got to read it. and You've got to study it. Then you've got to get into the context. It takes years. You know, my ministry is discerning the times. And I knew that when I first started. I knew that the first week I started. On my knees in Calgary praying for a whole day because I figured, this is ridiculous. God's left me. And so I prayed all day. And I met God. Now, I didn't meet him in any visible or noisy or loud voice. I just seemed to be in my heart. And he seemed to lead me to the Bible. And he said, read it. And read it because you're going to stand. And you're called to stand. And then it might not be popular, but you're still called to stand. And so as we progressed, and I was in, had some great fellowship believers. And, and I, I was involved with the Christian Cowboys, which really got you up to share the Lord. So I was sharing the Lord right away. You know, I had learned over the years. The certain times kind of happened because people would bring the promise keepers in different moves and, and I could tell right away what they were. They were not from God. They were from man. They were created to bring us into the ecumenical move and, and, uh, and happens the promise keepers are designed by the Catholic Church because they figured the year 2000 was when, when everything was going to happen. They're bringing it all together and everything began in the Catholic Church. They soon found out that that was a lie. God, God has his time. He's not on their time. So the, the irony is there's a rotten root. It's a slow festering root. It's a disease. The devil has it all figured out. It started shortly after creation. It got, it got so bad, God brought the fr flood and started over again with eight people, Noah and his three sons, Japheth. Shem and Ham along with four wives to repopulate the earth. The distinct, three distinct races and all went in separate directions. As we know, the devil has been active through all this time and continues to his date and one day God will reckon with him. At the start of the church age, Satan went to work creating false doctrine, false Bibles and on and on and on. It's really a seed planting process that grows tell it accumulates into the final stage of the false church under the Antichrist. The one world order of government until it's God's time to deal with it, with the rapture of the church and the seven year tribulation, the restoration of Israel, the final thousand year reign of Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. God is a covenant keeping God and will do exactly as he says and we can count on it. So when we doubt God and the problem we have today is there's people creating Bibles that don't even believe in God. But they got manuscripts and they think they fill in the blanks. The next question is, where are we all in this? Me, I'm ready to go home. And how about you? What about today? Well, it seems like some of the denominations of today are so compromising in a word, Bibles and leadership taught in colleges with Jesuit infiltrated professors or unbelieving religious leaders. And here's a quote from the top prophecy speakers in, in the world today, I was convinced, that, and I love the man, and I know he's sincere, but he said, it, even those who dearly love the King James have come to recognize its inadequacies and its growing and limitations to communicate clearly to modern English-speaking people. Well, that's a lie. That's the reason a revision has been recently produced and called the New King James Version. It's an excellent mo modern trash. That's also a lie. When I first got saved in the church in Mushta I went to, it was an awesome people. The pastor has become a very personal friend of mine. He's in Texas on missions the last 20 years. But him and, that, and the group there got me into about four or five different versions. They said, Ted, what you really need is you need all these versions. You know, you've got to get these versions. If you really want to understand the Bible, get these versions. Get out of your King James Bible. That was the first thing that they taught me. 
Get out of your King James Bible. You can't understand it. Well, I got saved reading the King James Bible because I read it from one end to the other, and when I got to Revelations, I knew as hell, and I gave my life to the Lord. I got saved in the book of Revelations and by two people that witnessed to me and told me I was going to hell. And I thought they were idiots, so I kind of found out later that they really knew what they were talking about. But the Bible told me that I was going to hell, and then I knew that I had to make a decision. That was that fraudulent King James Bible that told me about hell. And none of the other versions will tell you about hell because they don't want you to know about it. So they're telling me that this inadequate four-year-old kid can read this and understand it. So the King James Version is a translation like all other translations, and it has strengths and weaknesses. It is not perfect. No translation it is the original autographs, as scholars call the reading manuscript, are inherent, but all subsequent translations contain errors. The King James translate admitted this themselves in their induction. David can correct all this now. One thing, many Greek manuscripts of the New Testament have been discovered that they were much older than the ones the King James Version was based on. That's not true. Also, thousands of other Greek manuscripts dating from the first century had also been discovered, and these manuscripts give scholars a much better understanding of the meaning and nuisance of the Greek words at the time of the New Testament. Not true. You see, they have to justify what they're saying and they're being taught by Jesuits in colleges that are leading them say. This version is taken from the same original text the New King, the, uh, in the King James translation. It puzzled me why the New King James only advocates are just as hostile to this version as others, which comes from a different collection of texts. Well, not quite so e as easy to understand as the NIV. This version is a pretty good combination of both accuracy and readability. I use the New King James. Uh, until I got back to the King James, and I, I was blessed in it, a lot of thinking of it, but there were some questions I had on it. What happened to me is after I got all these versions, I had real trouble. None of them were the same. So I decided I'm going to prove these King James people wrong. I'm going to prove this King James is a piece of junk. They, they really know what they're talking about, because all my friends and leaders in these churches are telling me what I, that, that's really right. All these good honest people have been conned by leadership in colleges. So I took it upon myself. I read some books on the King James. I said, oh, they're just a bunch of proud people creating their own images. And so then I got the manuscript, the rating of all the, and I got that many books on the translations of the Bible. And, and, and I read them all, three years. And my wife will tell you, you wouldn't remember now, but I had a big piece of paper and I wrote all the different versions down and every time there was a difference, I wrote it down on each one. And I read all the scholars. The NIVs were liars. Who translates the New King James? The guy that did the NIV. He was one of the main ones. And uh, let's see, gay people, Gnostic, you name it, they were all in it. So you don't have real men. They're giving their version and filling in the blanks. So after three years of st reading to prove the King James wrong, I threw the rest of them, put them in a the shelf, and went back to King James. And I could understand it perfectly well. And some people don't understand. I tell them, read the context. Get into the context of the scriptures. If you're not sure, there's, but you have to read the whole Bible. What you see in Colossians, there's the rest of the story in Ephesians and in Philippians in the rest of the Bible. The rest of the story is in the whole Bible. It's not in one book. It's in all the books in the Bible. You get them all. That's why the study of Shore is self-approved, that a workman need not be ashamed. Well, then the same writer says, the same claims the Meshi's Bible is a treasure. That's unbelievable. That's Satan's... Is it? Hang on. You're okay. I'm okay? Yeah. You lost me, eh? I get to, you guys get me excited. <laughs> Well, then the King James has, in fact, been revised many times already. If you had a 1611 version in your possession, you would easily see all types of differences between that and, and the King James that is sold in today's store. Well, I did the reading from David Reagan. Uh, not, he's a scholar. He's dead. He passed in 2007, and he's got the tale of the three cities in that book back there. He lists all the different revisions, and they're all just spelling errors. From my knowledge, and David can correct it later, but... Uh, there was, no, there was nothing in doctrinal changes. 
and so they lie. And they don't even know they're lying because they've been taught that way. The gospel is far too important to risk turning readers with Elizabeth the English before they have a chance to learn from us what God has made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. It is far better to read a modern, vulgar translation, one in common used language, and understand it than to read the traditional one and have no clues of what it means. I gotta tell you something. If you don't if you read the Bible, you don't know what it means, it means you need to get saved. If you can't read that Bible and understand it, you need to get saved. Because God's the one that gives you the eyes to see it. When you, in the first chapter of Ephesians, study it. When you get saved, he illuminates you so you can see. But you've got to read it all. The King James Version, this version is possessing a few glaring errors and words that require explanation and relatively accurate. Spiritual things are difficult enough to understand without the additions of burden of language difficulties. I'm not going to tell you who that was. He's one of the top speakers. And he makes me sick. And then, the truth of the matter is, the more, none of the Greek manuscripts are perfect. They represent a passing together of segments of the most ancient manuscripts. Erasmus did his best. There have been thousands of manuscripts discovered since he put together his compilation. And many of those are much older than anything he had to work with. Furthermore, none of the differences in the complications have any effect on the basis, basic doctrine and truth of the New Testament. The King James defenders need to keep in mind that the major purpose of the new conservative translation is twofold, greater accuracy and easier to understand the language. How come these false, those aims? And the, the, here's one person that summed it up and I'm not going to get into it, but time has come to lay a rest with honor and dignity, with fruitful hearts, the King James Bible. Well, I'm sorry, it's time to pick up the real Bible and read it. And that's just what makes me really upset when I read these things about what people are saying. Question is, some of us, some of those so-called experts are so wise, why do they use four to six versions in their book? Does it take that many to find out what they wanted to say? Really and truly, if you need six different versions of the Bible, to say what you wanted to say, you mean to tell me you have to find something, you have to keep looking so it tells you what you wanted to say? How about just going to the Word of God that's a word-for-word -word translation? Then it tells you exactly what it says. You don't have to read man's corrupted manuscript books. Why do they say they cannot use prophecy? From There's another one. The authorized King James. I have two of the top speakers told me we cannot use the King James Bible and the Hebrew in the Old Testament in Ezekiel 38 to 39 to preach prophecy, they need the Greek from Setuzenic because it's more accurate and Jesus used it. Really? When it believed it not even existed until after Christ? It's unbelievable. Really and truly. They said they can't preach Ezekiel 38 and 39 and 30 without going to the Greek and going to the New Bibles. So, I picked up the phone and I phoned a friend of mine that's a Hebrew. He talks, he speaks Hebrew. And I asked him to go to the Hebrew and tell me what it says, the original writings. And he went, he came back, he said, the King James is word for word. He said, I don't see one problem with it. You see the con job? They can't preach what they want, so they had to get a version that preaches what they wanted to say. That's sad. That's a sad thing to say about beliefs both scholars that are up preaching and telling us what God's saying. They can't use the word of God to say they've got to create their own language, their own version. But doctrine is taken out of the new Bibles. The blood, hell, redemption. I know two preachers that are very famous on TV and on the radio that tell you it wasn't necessary for Christ to shed his blood for the remissions of our sins. He's using the ESV. He's been using it for years. You're telling me that he didn't have to go to the cross and shed his blood for you and me? What did he go to the cross for? What did he take our sins upon his body and bear him? And what did he shed his blood for the remission of our sins if it wasn't necessary? We go back under the law. And then try to live God life. I get a little excited in some of this stuff. 
some thoughts and queries. First, me. How can an educated person like me determine what is right and how can I find it so easy to understand? I don't know how I can do it. I couldn't get my grade 12. I flunked out. I, I, yeah, finally, I quit and went to work because I could make more money. But you know what happened? God put me in, 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 in a corporation in Vancouver. I worked for three years in a surgical place and learning and purchasing. And then I went, come back and I went to Regina, to Winnipeg, to Montreal, to Toronto, to Chicago, to Southern Illinois, back to Canada. And in those, I was taught seed planting. Believe it or not, the corporation taught me how to seed plant. I was in a plant with 150 people in Chicago. I was sent from one place to another because I was going to be a general manager in Houston in 10 years from one date when they select me. They took 13 of us from their world group and said, you will be the top managers in future years. And so I went, Winnipeg, Montreal, Toronto, Chicago, Illinois. I learned how to seed plant. If I wanted you to do something, I could start about six months before. And I'd just go plant a word. I'd come back in a week and plant another word. And come back another week and plant another word. I was taught to do that. It wasn't long when you brought the idea to me. See, now you, I could, you tell me what we needed because I just planted a seed. The devil does that. He plants seeds in your mind. Then he plants another seed. Then he plants another seed. So pretty soon, you're following that seed. You think it's from your mind. You figure, you figure, it's really Satan planting the seed. Just like I would plant a seed to get what I wanted out of the people I work with. And I finally figured out I was, wasn't, was never going to be a good man, top executive. I better quit and come back to Saskatchewan. Because <laughs> if they promoted me any lever than middle management, I'd probably be incompetent at what I did. So... <laughs> So that's where it goes. What are the consequences? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. The remnant of true believers are not subject to God's wrath and will go home to be with the Lord. What should concern us is how about the ones sucked in? Are we called to be watchmen? You bet. Now it's not easy to warn people, but more it's easier to love them and be an example to them. You know, some of the things I like is tracks. You know, Kent will tell you he got saved from a track. I got saved because he preached at me and some drunken cowboy in Alberta told me I was going to hell, so I had to prove them wrong, so I read the Bible. And so that's how I got. I didn't need a track. I needed the Bible. And uh, I had a mother that loved the Lord and told me one day I would get saved. Of all her family, I would be the one to get saved. And I told her she was, she was foolish and an idiot because I'd never get saved because I hated God. Well, she died... 14 years later before I got saved and her prophecy come true. I'm no, some of my family do not believe in and don't even want anything to do with me, but I belong to the family of God today. And I love my family, my fleshly family as well. But I'm sorry I can't follow their path. And then for, I read up, I went up to, uh, to do my testimony God has a funny way. I was, when I first got saved, he wouldn't let me give my testimony. He just seemed to shut me down, shut me down, and shut me down. And I was on the board of directors of the court, Canadian Quarter Horse and the Saskatchewan Quarter Horse, on the board of uh, the Reigning Horse Maturity in Moose Jaw. I was on the board of the Moose Jaw Board uh, Exhibition Grounds. I was on the board of, the, of the Amateur Hockey. I'm one of the founding members of the AAA Midget Executive. There were three of us started that way back in the middle 80s. That was, we all know the AAA midgets today is, is one of the top midget leagues in the world today in Canada. And I was one of the, for Saskatchewan, I was the, one, of the, one of the executives that started that. And so I did all this, me nothing anymore. But one day, every spring, there was a quarter horse show where a whole bunch of horses would come in. There'd be about 400 people there and about a couple hundred horses. And, and then God said, you can tell your testimony. Now, I'm on the board of directors, and I used to get drunk with all these guys. And I used to drink with all these guys. So suddenly I walk in, in April, and I got saved in August. I walked in with a Bible in my hand. I was with the Christian Cowboys, and I got up and shared my testimony. You know, actually, one guy got to give his life to the Lord after my testimony. 
And I praise the Lord for that. And another guy did said he did, I don't know for sure. But I got up to share my testimony in front of this crowd. And every Sunday morning they'd have Cowboy Church at the Quarter Horse Bank. It was a big show. And after that, I, didn't, I lost all my friends. I lost all my Quarter Horse friends. I lost all my reigning horse friends. I lost all those people. They don't want to talk to me anymore because I want to be with God and I didn't really care what they thought. But you know, I walked the walk and three years later those same people talked to me because they wanted to know if I was real. They started talking to me. You see, it isn't sometimes what you say, it's what you do. And I found that 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 was blessed and I got to share a lot and, and I've had the pleasure of seeing a lot of people come to the Lord and doing Bible studies with them and God is, is an awesome God that saves people. All we can do is plant the seeds in water and God gives the increase so we can take no credit for anything except being living epistles. And that was the fun of it. And this conference is, is the fun is we want to tell people the word, to get in the word of God. We want to tell people what's happening what's going to happen, the Prophecy Conference in the spring. Uh, it's going to be at the World Trade Center, and there's a new Sandman Inn going up. It's going to be open in March, and it's going to seat about 400. There's a special room that they, they give us, uh, give us a better rate. The Saskatoon Inn tripled their charges, so we just couldn't go there anymore. It would have been about a $40,000 bill to go there. So, uh, so in, the Sask in the World Trade Center actually reduced our cost from what we were playing the Saskatoon Inn. And, it's a, and we can bring food there, you can eat there, you can do whatever you want. So, and they're going to have, a, this will be a lot more comfortable. What about these two gentlemen that are going to bless us with their God-given gifts? You know, have you ever met these two guys, and you've probably met them last year, if some of you, you're going to meet them this year, they're a lot of fun, you know. They're not just Bible scholars and, and studies, and people that have God's given them gifts to what's going on, so they can bring to us what God's given them. They're also awesome men in the Lord and their families. So I appreciate them. We even talked David to stay in for a couple of days so we can aggravate him more. <laughs> I think Kent's taking him hunting on Monday. So, so that's going to be good. And I got him on Tuesday. So I got pneumonia two weeks ago, so I'm careful what I do. So I've been on some medicine. I'm, I'm okay now, but, it, but uh, so I have to watch a little bit. I made sure I didn't go out until after. But I appreciate these two men. And you're going to enjoy the great gift that God has given them to come to us and share. And we're going to learn from them. The Feast of Israel, are they important? You know, I never thought much of the feast, and the early church never thought much of the feast. And I was in Israel a couple of times, and my, my mother was Jewish. Uh, and I didn't really care. And every time I'd cuss at the Jews, she'd say, look out one of these days, you can find out me one of them. So that was her famous saying, but she never ever admitted she was Jewish. Uh, she'd come from the minute out of the, out of, uh, the Ukraine. And uh, she loved the Lord, and she read the Bible every day, and I used to love her, but I used to really give her a hard time about her Bible. And she used to tell me, Ted, one day you're going, oh, my sons, you're going to get saved. Ma, you know what you're talking about. But you know, before she died, about six months, she took me aside and she said, I'm going to go, I'm going home. And uh, I get emotional this time. But, but how a mother can know that a man's going to get saved out of all her sons and daughters. That was faith on her part. She must have known something about me when I was born, maybe, I don't know. But you never know where God's going to leave you. So I studied the Feast of Israel, and I suddenly realized how important these feasts are. There's nothing that God has did from the birth of Christ. God manifests in the flesh. He always was and always will be, and he's the everlasting. The Alpha and Omega was born in the fall feasts. He was manifest in the fall feasts. I can, you can prove it from the first chapter of Luke, and you can prove it by just looking at the feasts, the meaning of the feasts. In fact, probably a case of the people that have researched it, and all I've studied, I've studied the feast quite thoroughly, is that he was born, he was manifest the first day of the feast of the tabernacle. He was circumcised on the eighth day, which was a high Sabbath day. And that's my theology. It's not biblical. 
because God didn't tell us because we were supposed to talk about him going to the cross, what he did, the Passover lamb, a completed feast. So they're important. We should study the feasts and understand them. And I've, once I've studied them, I really appreciate them. The tables and books. Oh, five minutes. Got a new thing. What's that? Oh. It don't matter. On the back table, there's a whole bunch of books and a whole bunch of DVDs and stuff from Chris and David. Uh, the one I really enjoyed is, But I Trust the Scholars. A little book. David did a marvelous job. Even got my attention. Even got me to read it. <laughs> one who can't read too good. It's, it's, a, it's an awesome. And there's a bunch more back there. And Dennis Banks is sitting back here. Stand up for a minute, Dennis. Uh, if you remember Adrian Bank? A lot of you know Adrian. That's her brother. His fame comes from his sister. Or maybe his, her fame comes from him. But anyway, he wrote a little book, The Piper. And it explains a lot of little things in it that you might want to get and read it. He brought 50 books and, uh, as well. And we brought all these books of David's. Uh, and so... You enjoy it's an awesome, I like I love the book. It tells you the difference. What one scripture says and what another Bible says and why there's change, why the blood was taken out. It's just a little short story on each one. Simple Simon Meek and McMee can read it and understand it. It's very good. That new track, is that all? That's an I just read that today. He gave it to me. He, he, it's brand new, hot off the press. So when you see him back there, you're getting the first ones distributed. Am I right? Yeah, they're not out yet. So they're out now. Yeah, just take one. It's, it's, really, it's really awesome. It's a neat little, but he writes, this is a guy that writes, all, you got all these chick tracks? He's a writer. Somebody else does a drawing because he said he can't draw. Well, maybe he can. Do, are you doing any drawing? I can draw flies if I don't take a bath. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody draws and he fills in the words. And it's an awesome. Kent will tell you, he got saved by reading the King James Bible, became the Chick Track. And I, we've given out thousands of them. And we just got another couple of thousand going into the prison. So they're probably one of the best tracks in existence. The only one I like equal to it is the Ultimate Questions. It's a little booklet on the Ultimate Questions that really goes back to the Reformation. And we give hundreds of those out as well. And. Uh, so they're, they're little they're things to read. That's it. End of the show. And so I want to thank you all. And I want you to enjoy the conference. Any questions, talk to somebody that knows. That's probably not me. But I want enjoy. it's a great time of fellowship. When a Bobby of believers gets together, it's a time of fellowship. It's a time of enjoying each other's company. A time to listen to the men like David and Chris that have the gift that God gives them, this brings it to us, and the spring conference is be the same. Uh, and so we look forward to them all. One question, would you sooner have the conference in the fall or would you have it in the spring? Whoever wants it in the fall, raise their hand. Who would want it in the spring? Raise their hand. We were thinking that the World Trade Center said we could have it either place, either time. So we're, that's the decision to make. And we'll probably leave it where it is, mostly because it's, everybody's used to it now. And just trading places, that's all. So I want to thank you. Father, we thank and praise you for today. We thank you for this great blessing you've given us. And we thank you for the people that have come and the people that will come. And we just give you the praise and the glory and the thanks. And we commit today to you. And thank you for it through Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.